talking about a, a very brief overview of what we know about substance use and abuse in later life, and we'll then turn it over to Kathy. Uh, next slide, please. You can see in this slide, this just gives you an overview of, of what we know about the prevalence of uh, different use of substances for those um, uh, over the age of uh, 60. And we think about at-risk drinking as one of the areas that are um, is an important area to be focused on because it's only focused on people that have the most severe drinking problems, those that might meet criteria for abuse dependence. You're really talking about a very small portion of the older adult population, something on the order of 2 or 4%. Think more broadly about people that are drinking over recommended limits, and we'll talk about that in a minute, um, that may be placing their health at risk because they're drinking over recommended drinking limits. Then we want to try to think of those as, as at-risk drinkers who might benefit from some brief advice and brief interventions to reduce their consumption because the interactions with uh, alcohol and medications and the interactions of alcohol with chronic illnesses play their health at higher risk because they're drinking over those limits. And estimated that anywhere from 15 to 20 percent of, of individuals who are in primary care settings are these so-called at-risk drinkers. In other healthcare settings, the rates have been similarly high and uh, really are a good target group for intervening with individuals. We want to talk about uh, the changing face of drug abuse as uh, we see the baby boomers uh, 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 reaching later life. And illicit drug use currently in older adults is relatively small, anywhere from 1% to 5% now. There's some indication that that's changing fairly rapidly as the baby boomers age because they're more likely to use uh, illegal drugs, especially marijuana. And so we are probably going to be seeing some major changes in the not too distant future in terms of use of illegal drugs. But, but right now, the older adult population is relatively modestly involved with uh, illegal or illicit drugs. Here's the alcohol abuse and dependence group. Um, and if you think about those under age 60, it's 5 to 10 percent of the overall population under age 60. But over age 60, it's on the order of uh, 2 to 4 percent, as I said. And those are individuals who have significant involvement with alcohol, with consequences related to their use of alcohol, and increased tolerance, and some also. Um, uh, uh, potential uh, withdrawal symptoms. Now, general population studies, the rates are lower. So if you take the entire population in uh, the community, if you went door to door to just assess whether or not people have problems with alcohol and drugs, the rates are relatively lower than in healthcare settings. Healthcare settings are a really good location for identifying people with alcohol and drug um, issues because they're more likely to attend those settings. So we often will focus our work in a variety of health care and other social service settings because I think it's a good place to identify people and the likelihood that they're going to have more problems is greater. Next slide. So a little bit more about, uh, uh, we could slide up there. The percentages of uh, past month cigarette alcohol and illicit drug use in older adults, uh, these are, are increasing uh, with more uh, current data, although we do have the numbers uh, from SAMHSA, we know that there are some increases that are occurring. As you can see from this slide, alcohol use uh, among non-Hispanic whites is about half of the individuals in the community are using alcohol much less likely for uh, non-Hispanic blacks and blacks, uh, African-Americans, and Hispanics. Um, I point out always that cigarette use remains high in the overage uh, 60 group, and we should be thinking about these individuals as a potential for focused uh, interventions. And there you can see the rates of binge alcohol use are 
higher in minority communities than in uh, uh, non-Hispanic whites. And then there's the al heavy alcohol use and the illicit drug use that I've kind of referred to previously. Next slide. What I want to try and focus on a bit today is also talking about the uh, intersection between alcohol and medication misuse. It's estimated that about in five older Americans are affected by the use of alcohol with prescription medications. This is a, uh, an important and potentially growing problem, especially with the increases in the use of pain medications, the opioid analgesics, as being a major area of concern, especially when mixed with alcohol. So it's an area we really want to start focusing on to intervene with individuals, to educate them about the dangers of drinking with with their prescription, why taking prescription medications that are psychoactive. Next slide. Uh, and this highlights an important study that was conducted around people that uh, were problem drinkers and and also had uh, chronic pain. Um, and it's really important to highlight that in the study, all problem drinkers actually reported more severe pain. They had a disruption of daily activities due to pain, and more frequent use of alcohol to manage their pain compared to, compared to older non-problem drinkers. And that their pain was associated with more use of alcohol to manage their pain. And so, and relationships were stronger among older adults with drinking problems than those with with, with them. So, if someone is taking pain, has chronic pain, is taking pain medications, uh, we want to be assessing whether or not they're having problems with alcohol and are using alcohol in a in a uh, at risk manner because it really places them at much higher risk. And the alcohol does not solve the problems that may be uh, related to managing their pain, including breakthrough pain. So we should be focusing on these individuals. Next slide. So recommendations in terms of alcohol consumption. These are from National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism uh, and from the CDC. And people over age 60, the recommended maximum daily consumption is no more than one drink a day for both men and women. And that binge drinking, if you think about uh, uh, periodic episodic heavy drinking, which is a very dangerous pattern of consumption, it's defined for men as no more than three drinks on a drinking day, and for women, no more than two drinks on a drinking day. Emphasizing that people should not use alcohol with psychoactive medications, and that these rates for, for older people are half of that for younger individuals. So the, the rates that are recommended for um, uh, uh, young people are no more than two drinks per day, and the binge drinking uh, definitions are three or more drinks on a drinking day for men and two or more, I mean, three or more, sorry, for younger people are four or more drinks on a drinking day, and for, for women, uh, no more than three drinks or three or more drinks on a drinking day uh, is the binge episode. Um, Definitions. So sorry about that a little bit, but the idea is that these are lower um, recommendations than for younger people, and are fairly modest. Uh, uh, really, are aimed at preventing problems, preventing negative consequences related to alcohol consumption. So the thing is, so what are we talking about? One drink. Next slide. And we want to make sure that we are educating people about this concept of standard drinks. It's one of the main components of the brief intervention work that uh, uh, Chris Barry will talk about in a minute. Uh, that is that different beverage alcohol has roughly the same amount of ethanol, the active ingredient, if you measure the alcohol. So what can a bottle of ordinary American beer, 12 ounces, have roughly the same amount of ethanol as a single shot of distilled spirits, that's one and a half ounces, that's just a shot glass of 80 proof vodka, for example. That's the same amount of alcohol as five ounces of wine. That same amount of alcohol as four ounces of sherry or the sweet stuff, the cures. Uh, and so these different beverages are roughly equivalent in ethanol um, concentration and are defined as one drink. 
So just educating an older person about this standard drink idea can be very useful because people don't often know that beer and wine have the same amount of alcohol as distilled spirits. The key is that you measure your beverages, and if you're sure, this is the daily limit, no more than one of these per day. And with that, I'm going to go to the next slide and turn it over to Kathy Cameron. Good, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm going to go through these slides very quickly um, in an effort to move on to um, the discussion of intervention strategies, screening, and brief interventions for alcohol and psychoactive medications that Chris Berry and Stephen Ferrante will discuss. But I want to start with, um, you know, by first recognizing that older adults use a disproportionate share of all prescription and over-the-counter medications to treat chronic acute and chronic conditions that they suffer from. In older adults, are also more likely to be prescribed medications long-term, which can lead to substance misuse and abuse problems with certain types of medications, specifically the psychoactive medications. And we know that approximately one in four, about 25% of older adults use one of these uh, prescription psychoactive medications that have potential to be uh, misused or abused. And that's really the group that um, are at highest risk for use and abuse, and those are the ones that we want to try to screen and intervene on, um, identify and prevent problems. Uh, and older adults take these medications because they suffer from conditions like arthritis, um, uh, headaches, things like that that result in chronic pain. They often have um, insomnia and um, anxiety or feelings of nervousness or tension, and therefore they are being treated for these conditions with medications like the opioid analgesics, propane, and benzodiazepines for sleep disorders and anxiety. We've been using the term psychoactive medication in this webinar, and I think it would be helpful to have a definition. And um, simply, um, a psychoactive medication is a substance that moves from the bloodstream into the brain and it acts primarily on the central nervous system, where it acts um, neurotransmitters in the brain and receptors in the brain, and it results in changes in perception, such as changes in the perception of pain, mood, cognition, behavior, and consciousness. So um, just to give you a sense of the prevalence of medication misuse, um, there have actually been few studies that have specifically examined the prevalence and nature of medication misuse in this population, and the results have been mixed, but overall, prescription medication misuse affects a small but significant and growing portion of the older adult population, and a few studies are listed on this slide. Uh, what we do know is that psychoactive medication misuse is a growing problem across the United States among all age groups, and you've probably seen articles about this problem in, in the papers. There's been a lot of news coverage of the use of such things as opioid analgesics. Um, and it's growing um, in part due to, as Fred talked about, the aging of the baby boomers who have very different attitudes and experiences using drugs, including prescription drugs with um, abuse potential. And one indicator of the growth of this problem is emergency department visits involving medication misuse and abuse. And since 2004, there's actually been a 121% increase in emergency department visits involving medication use by older adults, defined as those um, 50 and older. And we're seeing the largest increases in the younger old, that is the baby boomer population. Um, this slide shows uh, more evidence of the impact of medication misuse. One fifth of emergency department visits involving prescription medication misuse were made by persons age 60 and over, older. And the medications most commonly seen um, in these uh, e visits are uh, pain relievers, uh, medications for anxiety, insomnia, and antidepressants. Um, although Medication misuse has huge economic consequences, and as the study shows, um, you know, there are lots of emergency department visits as a result of medication misuse, and many um, older adults have to be hospitalized as a result of these problems. So what is medication misuse? Um, we can kind of think of the use of psychoactive prescriptions as a continuum that reaches from appropriate use. That is, 
using the correct medication, dose of the medication, and using it for the intended period of time um, as prescribed for legitimate uh, medical problems. Um, and the continuum goes through misuse, abuse, and dependence. This slide shows the DSM-4 definitions of medication misuse. Um, you also hear the term non-medical use of prescription medications. Sometimes that's used for the misuse of prescription drugs and abuse of prescription drugs. So uh, misuse by the patient, um, it would involve taking um, a higher dose than prescribed, um, taking a medication for much longer than prescribed, um, for purposes other than prescribed, such as to, to get a euphoric effect from the medication. Um, use in conjunction with other medications and alcohol to get a desired effect. And then the misuse by the practitioner or the prescriber, and that could be prescribing for an inappropriate um, indication. And I think a, a common one among older adults is continually prescribing a sedative hypnotic or benzodiazepine for a sleep disorder instead of reassessing the continued need for that medication. Um, so. Um, prescribing something higher dose than is really needed for an older adult, or to monitor or fully explain the appropriate use of medications. I think this happens a lot um, in pain management. Next slide. And then uh, medication abuse and dependence is defined here on this slide. Um, for the patient, it results in declining physical and social function, use in risky situations, and continued use despite social and uh, personal consequences. And then there's a definition for dependence, which can result in tolerance or withdrawal uh, because of the physical dependence um, as a result of using or being uh, using the medication. So, what about who is at risk for uh, medication misuse and abuse? And there been a couple of studies looking at the, these factors that um, increase the risk for medication misuse and abuse. And one is female gender. Um, and it may be because females are, are more often prescribed things like opioid analgesics and benzodiazepines. Social um, isolation is another risk factor for medication misuse. Our older adults may be um, self-medicating loneliness or, or depression. Uh, history of substance abuse. So persons with history of substance abuse are more likely to abuse prescription meds later in life. And then I also know that older adults with prescription medication dependence are more likely to have a dual diagnosis, uh, depression being a common um, condition that many folks suffer from. And then medical exposure to prescription medications with abuse potential. Um, here are some of the common signs um, and symptoms of medication uh, misuse and abuse. If you will look at this list, you'll see that many of these signs and symptoms are common among older adults and um, are often overlooked or attributed to other problems like dementia or Parkinson's disease, go to the next slide. So which makes screening um, and identifying people who are misusing medications difficult. And these are some other um, signs and symptoms. So loss of appetite, changes in activities of daily living, um, falls is very common, changes in speech, loss of motivation, um, family or marital, um, discord, and then seeking behavior such as doctor shopping or requesting refills for certain prescriptions um, sooner than, um, than should be refilled. There are many um, psychoactive medications that can be misused and abused, including both prescription and over-the-counter medications. But the primary psychoactive medications of concern for older adults are um, are different classes of medications. That is the central nervous system depressants, and that, those include um, medications to treat the conditions that I mentioned previously, anxiety, um, insomnia, those sorts of things. And benzodiazepines are really the primary class of medications right now um, used to treat those conditions. Um, barbiturates aren't being used and prescribed as much as um, they were in the, like the 70s and 80s. The next class are opioid or morphine derivatives. These are the narcotic analgesics um, that um, are very effective in relieving pain. Go on. So this gives um, a bit more information about benzodiazepine misuse and abuse. And we see with benzodiazepine, 
benzodiazepine misuse and abuse, older adults may be self-medicating hurts, losses, depression, loneliness, as I've mentioned. Um, studies have shown that older adults are prescribed more benzodiazepines than any other age group. And although recommended for short-term use, many um, have taken, many take these for long, long periods of time for anxiety and sleep problems. And as I mentioned, they can cause confusion, um, falls, and um, it can also cause cognitive impairment in older adults. So this slide lists some of the common benzodiazepines. Um, I believe both a generic and brand name. And when we send out the PowerPoint slides to everyone, we will have a more complete list of these medications as additional resources on this topic. Um, this is an interesting study on benzodiazepine use among older adults. Remember that these medications are recommended for short-term use only. Um, they're often prescribed long-term use. But what this study found is that both those continuing and those not continuing daily use of these medications um, both reported significant improvements in sleep quality and depression, and there are no differences between these two groups in rates of improvement. So it really raises concerns about the benefit of continuing to prescribe these medications. Um, well, this study has shown that there's really no benefit in continuing the use, but there are certainly lots of risks associated with long-term use of these meds. The next major class, as I've mentioned, are the opioid analgesics um, for the relief of pain. Sometimes when they're being misused, they'll be used to help people sleep, relax, um, so on. Um, these medications really need to um, have a dose reduction when they're prescribed because of changes in absorption and metabolism and changes in receptor sensitivity um, for these medications. So some of the problems that we see with the use of of these medications, um, I mentioned sedation is certainly a common one, excessive sedation, confusion, and respiratory depression. Um, also, these medications are highly correlated with um, increased falls risk. There are some examples on this slide. Um, Fred mentioned a huge concern um, among the use of, of alcohol um, in older adults is the interaction with medications. And many medications interact with alcohol, including those that are most likely to be uh, misused and abused. As Fred said, about five, one in five may be affected by the combined difficulties of alcohol and med misuse. Go on. Um, the number of mechanisms by which medications and alcohol interact, um, but really the take-home message from this slide is that alcohol, even in very small amounts, increases or magnifies the central nervous system effects of psychoactive medications because alcohol itself is a, is a depressant. Um, that's why it's really important to screen and educate older adults about the dangers of, of medications with alcohol. So, um, so that's a very brief overview, and as I mentioned, we will be sending you some additional resources with more detail um, on this topic. But um, now I'm going to turn it over to Kristen Berry. Um, and Mr. Barry will talk about prevention strategies to screen for and intervene for those with uh, medication and alcohol misuse problems. Thank Thanks, you. Kathy. Um, I think this is a great introduction for taking us to the next step in terms of what we need to be doing to be helpful to older adults who are experiencing at risk or problem use of alcohol or psychoactive medications in particular. I'm going to be spending a little time talking about the expert model. This is a model that includes screening, brief interventions, and referral to treatment where needed. Next slide. We're going to be starting with talking about the screen portion. Screen is a very important part of determining what's going on with older adults and having some standardized screen instruments that we can use makes it much easier to help us figure out what's going on and what we can do to be helpful. Next slide. The goal of screening, and there's two major goals. The first goal is to identify people who are at risk, problem drinkers, people with alcohol, 
codependence, to identify people with psychoactive medication misuse. So it's identification. That's what we're using the screening for. The second part is to determine if there's further assessment and or form of treatment needed. And there are a number of treatments that are available. Um, in there's formal standardized treatment but there's also um, brief treatments that are often used. And there is a book that was developed out of a whole series of training and treatment uh, approaches for brief interventions developed that SAMHSA has published by Larry Schoenfeld from the University of South Florida. And this is on brief treatment. So I think that could be a helpful and useful uh, resource for people, and let you all of the list of resources and things at the end of this conference. The rationale right for screening is that there's a high enough incidence that you heard from both Fred and Kathy. There are adverse effects on quality and the quantity of life, and there are effective treatments that are available. There are valid and cost-effective screening techniques. Next slide. Generally speaking, when we do screening, we like to cover a few kinds of issues. The first issue we like to cover is how much is being used, basically quantity and frequency of use, both for alcohol and for psychoactive medications, and the extent that we can determine that for illicit drugs. In alcohol consumption, we like to use screening tools that include quantity, frequency, and binge drinking, all of which are markers of potential issues that need to be dealt with. We also like to look at alcohol consequences to see if there are some short-term and longer-term consequences that people are experiencing. One of the screening tools that works quite well for this was Audit, the Alcohol Use Disorders Identification Test. It was developed by the World Health Organization in a country study, and it's been widely used all over the world in many languages. And Audit C is the first questions of the audit, which is the quantity, frequency, and binge drinking questions. Those are all very good questions that can be used. The health screening survey is a survey that we developed um, a number of years ago that included alcohol, quantum frequency, and binge drinking, but it also included other health behaviors. It included nutrition, exercise, smoking, um, nutrition. So what we're trying to do is what I want to do when we work with older adults, and that's put the alcohol use or the psychoactive medication use in the context of health. By looking at another number of health behaviors, we can both target the alcohol or the psychoactive medications, but we can also be of assistance with other things, the issues for people that they might wish to change. Fred brought up a very good point about smoking earlier. The instrument that we've used and has adapted for use with psychoactive medications for use and misuse is the ASSIST. It's an instrument developed by the National Institute of Drug Abuse and originally developed to deal with illicit drug use. And we and others have adapted this to with um, psychoactive medications in particular. Next slide. Once we've screened, next slide, please. Once we've screened, uh, we need to move to the next step if the person that we're working with screens positive. Um, Fred talked about what screening positive 
was in terms of alcohol use. Um, and we've also heard from Kathy a lot about what might be considered positive for psychoactive medication misuse. Into brief interventions, I want to talk a little bit, bit next slide, please, about um, the definition and talk a little bit of what about it goes into a brief intervention. Brief interventions are time limited, so they can be anywhere from five minutes to five brief sessions, and they target a specific health behavior. In this instance, these instances, we are targeting alcohol use and we're targeting psychoactive medication use in particular. Uh, goals are to either reduce the use, um, to the use pattern to help people who are using both alcohol and psychoactive meds to help them to um, cut back on the psychoactive meds and not use alcohol. Because the combination of the two, as Kathy mentioned, is deadly. And it's an important issue for us to be dealing with. And also can facilitate treatment entry. The brief intervention definitions come from a SAMHSA Treatment Improvement Protocol, number 34, on brief interventions and brief treatments for substance abuse. There's empirical support for both the screen techniques and empirical support for effectiveness of brief interventions with both younger adults and older adults. There have been over 100 studies done that are randomized control trials look at brief interventions to see how they work in different populations. And they've proven to be a very effective method of working with older adults. Next slide, please. The reason we're looking at this slide right now is I want to spend a couple minutes talking about who we tend to target with brief interventions. Uh, brief interventions often target people who are anywhere in the at-risk and problem use, and we do target people in the severe use and more serious problems to them get into treatment. But in the at-risk use in particular, that's a group that we see more older adults in than we do, uh, than we see older adults who have abuse or dependence. And often we remember the people that we work with who have the most serious problems, but if we do universal systematic screening, we find that most older adults fit into the at-risk and or problem use if they're having problems related to alcohol or to psychoactive medication. So it's important to remember that that's a group we also want to target with this. Slide. But the thing that we want to avoid, and the reason that we've all worked for a long time developing materials and many other people to work with both screening and interventions for older adults, for alcohol and for psychoactive meds, is we're trying to set up systems so that both aging services network the people providing the services are not overworked. And so we've developed pretty streamlined methods to do this. And those methods and all the materials for that will all be available to all of you. Next slide. Components to an alcohol brief intervention are screening, feedback, Motivation to change. So we use motivational interviewing types of techniques for this. Strategies to change. We have a behavioral contract as part of this where we have an agreement with someone for how much they're going to cut back. Are they going to stop using um, either psychoactive meds or stop using alcohol while they're using? some psychoactive meds that have been prescribed for them, and follow-up. We generally use a workbook. Um, we have books available for you. The work 
textbook that will be available for you we developed with um, Larry Schoenfeld from the University of South Florida. Dr. Schoenfeld has done a group of work on older adults and substance use. He is the uh, developer and evaluator of the ESPERT program for older adults in Florida. And he worked with Dr. Bob Hazlitt, who did a great deal of training for that. So um, those materials will all be available to you. I'm going to now turn this over to Stephen Durante, who developed the ESPERT program in Broward County and did an excellent job developing it and could give all of you a lot of information about how you set up these programs. We talked about how you, what the problem is and how you screen for it, but Stephen is going to talk about how you really enact this in your setting. Stephen? Thank you, Chris. So far, the other presenters have talked to you about the prevalence, the complications, screening and assessment instruments and processes, and intervention approaches. And I'm going to share with you how in Florida, and particularly in Broward County and in South Florida, how we pulled this together and created the Florida Bright Project and initiated this in our community as well as across the state. And um, I'm going to start really with talking to you about the um, agency or the context in which we initiated this, this project. And, Broward County was the community, and Broward County Elderly and Veteran Services, where you heard I spent 20 years, um, was the first agency to implement this program in Florida. And the agency was a county and is a county governmental agency. The county is really charged with being the lead provider for older adults and veteran support services. Um, the agency itself had case management as its traditional and primary focal point and service. Um, the agency mainly was established to assist older adults with physical and cognitive impairments. Over time, the agency realized that it, it needed to take a more comprehensive approach in addressing the older adult population and built really a behavioral health continuum of care for that population that focused on both mental health and substance abuse issues. And although older adults in our community included the veteran population, so the assistance was offered to veterans, um, we also have uh, found that it sense as you look at sustainability of this program to perhaps be offering this to young, a younger veteran population as well. And the last point I would make about um, the agency's philosophy and, and really what the direction the agency began to take um, as the years went on is much more of a health promotion and approach to providing services to old adults and veterans. And specifically because of taking that type of approach, beginning to look at what type of evidence-based interventions and services are available and how does it fit into um, what the agency is doing and can be easily vetted, like the ESPER model. Next slide, please. It brought us to even venture in this direction, and it, it had to do with challenges the agency was facing in terms of providing services to the older adult population. And we were finding that um, more or older adults that were referred to our organization for assistance actually had substance misuse issues. And not only were we finding that in the referrals we were receiving, but as we began to more closely look at the individuals who we had been traditionally serving, we also began to find that at a minimum there was a risk of of substance misuse in our existing population as well. So wanting to address these issues in the elders we served, we looked initially to the local substance abuse service continuum. And because we were primarily an aging service provider and it was our specialty, we looked to those for whom substance abuse prevention and, and treatment was their specialty. And 
did we find that they were not really serving an older adult population, but we found that the infrastructure that they were delivering their services were not really conducive to the seniors we were serving. In fact, um, because practically all of those services were facility-based, they certainly um, were not environments that older adults were actively seeking to engage in. And of no fault to the providers, it hadn't been their experience really to serve an older adult population. They hadn't, didn't really set up outreach um, intake and even a service continuum that was senior friendly. Uh, in some instances, they even felt that bringing seniors into their treatment environment was a risk because they didn't really have the capacity to deal with all the issues that the, the adult population was facing. So as we were looking to them to provide support, they would turn around and look at us to say, you know, we, this, we're not set up for this. Um, you know, perhaps this is something we should take on together as, as a community. I think as each of the other presenters described to you, we were funding because there was not adequate support for these issues in our community that the primary care setting was in fact the setting that was providing support even though again, it was not designed to provide the type of support that would appropriately address substance misuse issues in older adults. Agency that had a desire to address mental health and substance abuse issues more effectively in the same population we were serving, recognizing the increased prevalence, recognizing the lack of uh, resources in our community, the next step really for us was advocacy. Um, we realized that we needed to engage key stakeholders in trying to identify some solutions to address this population. We all realized that although this was a community issue, since Florida is a state that um, has a high prevalence of a 60 plus population, and just to give you an idea, in Broward County, over 350,000 individuals are over the age of 60. It's approximately 20% of the entire population, so the county has been for a long time where the rest of the country is headed as, as our country continues to age. And so we felt that we needed to both advocate locally in our own community as well as to advocate on a state level and find some key folks on a state level that would be interested to work with us. And recognize that we needed to have data to support um, work that we wanted to do in identifying this as a priority area for funding and services. So we looked at what existing data we had in terms of what was already being collected around these issues in the older adult population, and in doing so recognized where we were falling short, and then attempted to collect additional data to help us uh, support the advocacy we were, we were going to move forward with. And really our, our initial approach was from more of an educational standpoint than a um, strong assertive standpoint that we needed community change. And we brought education to a number of existing community committees and forums and sort of began to address it in a very non-threatening way. Um, we also partnered with a statewide coalition and helped to create a local chapter of that coalition in our own community that we could build the momentum and the number of supporters ar around our issue, which eventually brought us in, in, in front of uh, decision makers and funders. And um, in that audience, uh, to the stance that we wanted to partner with our funders and help present to them solutions and work in a, in a partnership to uh, come up with what's the best approach. And certainly uh, sharing a lot of information about models like the ESPER model. The results of all this advocacy included our state identifying older adult mental health and substance abuse as a priority issue. It eventually led to state funding that targeted older adult substance abuse. And it also the state to apply for a SAMHSA grant 
for the Florida Bright Project, the, the use of spurt modeling successfully received that grant. Next slide, please. Um, all of that effort grew the Florida Bright Project, and the Florida Bright Project used the SBIRT model as its foundation.